And welcome to another edition of Musicians Reveal. Joe Kelly here, and it's a true honor to have our longtime friend, a great musician, producer, and leader of the three-time Grammy Award-winning group out of Minneapolis, Sounds of Blackness. We welcome once again, Gary Hines. How you doing, brother? I am blessed to it all, my brother. Thank you on behalf of Sounds of Blackness for your, your friendship, your brotherhood, and your support over these years and up till right now. So thank you. Yeah, appreciate appreciate that, and and thanks to, you know, give some time. You just flew in from L.A. We were talking beforehand. What what went over this weekend? Well, this past weekend, uh, brother Joe in uh, L.A., uh, right in the, the the heart of the black community, in in, in Crenshaw and Englewood, uh, at a place called Limert Park, was a reparations love rally and festival, a big outdoor festival. Uh, Regina Bell, Eric Benet, uh, Rotimi, Sounds of Blackness, uh, and and uh, other artists as well with the theme. Of course, there were speakers as well, as well, politicians, all uh, around the theme of reparations. And uh, they definitely wanted Sounds of Blackness um, because of our song, Time for Reparations. So uh, we had a great time. Yeah, and, and definitely important. I mean, you, you've the sounds of blackness have always spoken the truth and uh, gotten involved with things that are of much importance and continue, especially the last few years. I mean, time for reparations and uh, the current single "Woke" from the movie Black Skin. We got a lot to talk about, but yes, um, we do. <laughs> yeah, in in a capsulation, small capsulation for our audience about reparations. Tell us what you've been working for and, and towards and, and what is the progress that's being made? Uh, well, there's a few things. Uh, we released uh, Time for Reparations uh, actually last year, mm -hmm. and uh, it's been already uh, adopted by the uh, National uh, Committee on Reparations as their theme song. We've been in theme song kind of anthem mode for the past several years, as you know, uh, Brother Joe, because you right. keep up with us better than anybody. Um, but uh, Reparations, even though last uh, released last year, uh, continues to uh, have uh, an increasing presence uh, in the news and, and across the country uh, up to this day. And I think that's going to only continue to increase. And so airplay is starting all over again uh, with the song itself. Um, and that's a great thing, you know, on the uh, commercial professional side, but on the heart and soul and, and, and life side, uh, mm -hmm. We don't. We really want uh, time for reparations to be the anthem for the the movement for reparations. Which, as I know, you know, uh, it, it, it's surprising. So many people think that this is new, but the call for reparations goes back to the mid 1800s and 40 acres and a mule. So uh, it, we we remind everybody that reparations is not about a privilege. It's about a debt that's owed. Uh, and it goes back, you know, to the mid 1800s. So, and it's never had an anthem. And so uh, now you see the, the rally for reparations uh, that uh, we just spoke of and just were blessed to perform at. Uh, and then also while we were there, Brother Joe, and I didn't get a chance to tell you this off the air, mm -hmm. um, the great actor, actor uh, Idris Elba okay. is producing a documentary about guess what? Reparations, but specifically uh -huh. as it relates to, to black music and musicians, uh, and uh, while we were in L.A., uh, we also taped some footage and did some interviews um, with the uh, the great director, Allison Duke, who's directing this documentary called Paid in Full, uh, mm -hmm. Reparations in Black Music. And that's going to be uh, done in conjunction between the, the BBC and the CBC, the Canadian broadcast uh, company, uh, with Idris Elba's production company. So they look for artists who were singing about reparations and the only one they found were the sounds of blackness. So we're honored to be a part of that. So we kind of killed two birds with one stone while we were in LA, busy 36 right. hours. Right. And, and it's almost crucial for uh, these days with the industry. I'm sure, you know, that I'm not saying anything new for you that your music to go into different, you know, movies and different show TV shows and, and documentaries like that is, is very important, right? It's extremely important, Brother Joe, uh, because you and, and God bless you. And I'll get, I'm glad I get a chance to say this publicly. You are one of the few uh, stations across the country uh, that had the the kahunas to play time for reparations and woke. So 
it, it's it's really funny to such the contradiction because uh, the songs, those songs, including Woke, have been getting rave uh, uh, critical reviews in terms of content and the song and the groove and all that kind of thing. Uh, but then so many stations that are really conglomerate, just iHeart own now, uh, are afraid to play any conscious music. Um, so God bless you for that support. And uh, the, so the fact that uh, much of radio is hesitant to play the, these songs, uh, but they are being picked up. Uh, for film and TV is just a, a great vindication and a great blessing. Yeah, no, nobody's tapped me on the shoulder and said, don't push play on that song. You know? So <laughs> e even when I was first started out on radio, a commercial station, when we had the, the carts to put in and stuff like that in the yeah, vinyl, yeah. I was still independent, but it was a you know commercial station, but they never, never got on me for that. So well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, so... Um, you're from Minneapolis. We love the Minneapolis sound and you are, you know, you stayed there all along. I know you're from Yonkers. We'll talk about that yeah, a little sir. bit, <laughs> but, uh, you know, speaking of yourself and the sounds of blackness, you were right in the heart of the, uh, George Floyd murder. I, I guess your rehearsal space is a few blocks away and literally, yes. Uh, right. we rehearse, uh, primarily at, uh, Sabathony community center. Uh, in the heart of the South Minneapolis a black community, which again is literally like four or five blocks from where George Floyd was murdered. So you're absolutely right, Brother Joe. And, and uh, other connections uh, uh, to Brother George as well. Uh, he worked out at the same gym that I worked out. Uh, I, I'd never met him, but we were at the right. same gym. He also did security uh, for uh, our lead singer, Jamesia Bennett. Uh, so there, there were some personal uh, connections to him as well. And I'll never forget, uh, the first, the night of the first rally, the, the night after he was murdered, uh, mm -hmm. there were like, and the media downplayed how many people were there. But Joe, there were tens of thousands of people, literally. I mean, you could not fall down if you wanted to. I know because we were there. I, it was a Tuesday night, which is normally our vocal rehearsal night. And of course I canceled rehearsal on all the sounds of blackness were there. Right. And uh, I'll just I'll just say this quickly to, to, to finish, uh, finish the answer, but right at that first night, I'll never forget, um, this young uh, uh, teenage uh, Caucasian young lady, she was holding her sign up, Black Lives Matter, and she apparently recognized me from the group. Mm -hmm. And uh, she came up and she said, hey, Mr. Sounds of Blackness, you guys are one of my favorite groups. And she said, I bet you guys are gonna do a song about this. She said, but please do me a favor, and I'll never forget this, Joe. She mm -hmm. said, please don't make it a happy song. And I said, you know what, young lady, I promise you that will not happen. And the moment I spoke those words, uh, Joe, I started hearing the, the voice and the words of Fannie Lou Hamer, sick and tired. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And uh, put pen to paper. And uh, that week, Sounds of Blackness, uh, we wrote and then we recorded Sick and Tired. So um, that's the connection with George Floyd. And of course, we dedicated that to him. And then a portion of the proceeds from uh, any sales of, of Sick and Tired merch or the record go to the George Floyd Scholarship Foundation. So okay. we don't just we don't just talk the talk, we walk the walk. Right. Right. And uh, we encourage our, our viewers, listeners to go to YouTube and, you know, Sounds of Blackness just typing in some really powerful videos recently, you know, even even going back in in, in the uh, 90s, early 90s. But uh, currently, the last few years, really, really powerful stuff that you've been thank doing. You. So you, you, you and the sounds to be com commended for that. Oh, thank you so much, Brother Joe. And, and it, it's really something because uh, when Brother George was, was, was murdered, I was getting calls from PDs, uh, pr um, uh, program directors, for those mm -hmm. that don't know, uh, across the country, uh, you know, saying, you know, Gary, we need sounds, you know, the whole country, we need sounds to do another optimistic. We, but, but Joe, that's not how God was leading us. There was too much righteous indignation to come out with a don't worry, be happy song. Uh, and right. I, I believe to this day, if we had done that, we would have been seen as part of the problem instead of mm. part of the solution, not getting it. And so uh, I, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, God was delivered in his purpose in, in, in sending the words of Fannie Lou Hamer, we're sick and tired of being sick and tired because that was the mood of everybody at that, that, that those rallies that night. Young, old, men, women, black, white, Asian, Latina, native, everybody, uh, righteous indignation was the feeling and, and yes, people needed to be uplifted, but it needs to be from a, a really a standpoint of truth and consciousness. 
Yeah, you're from the Twin Cities since the 60s. You moved there, you and your family, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So take us through some of the stuff, you know, that mentioned the things that have gone wrong. Have you seen improvements through the years? And, you know, the Twin Cities, we love the Twin Cities, but how did you get to this point? I mean, it's all over the country and the world, but right. specifically your city, what what has gone wrong and, and any positive things you talk about? I'm sure there's a lot. There's been progress, uh, but then there's been regression as well uh, here in the Twin Cities and across the country. Um, I would be <laughs> pressed to ever thank Donald Trump for anything, but if there was anything I would thank him for, it would be to pull the veneer off of things that were already seething just just under uh, the radar um, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and across the country. Uh, where people were trying to say after Barack Obama was uh, elected, we're now in post-racial America and, and uh, all things are, are, are free and wonderful and equitable. It's like, no, 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 nothing could be further or farther from the truth. Right. And here in the Twin Cities, there's, Brother Joe, there's, there's that same contradiction that I'm sure exists in other parts of the country as well. Um, you've heard the, tome, the term Minnesota nice. Minnesota yeah. nice is a reality, you know. Mm -hmm. I, some people would say, "No, it's not." It's a, it's a, but on the other reality is, you know, there's still this was the anti-Semitic capital of the world, for right here in the Twin Cities. Wow. Uh, you and the, you would see some of the same signs that you would see in Mississippi: uh, no Jews, no niggers, no dogs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so right. that that contradiction was always there, and so with that reality that that a lot of times people like governor DeSantis you know want to overlook or deny right. unless and until we face that and acknowledge that it's just like you know uh, aa the first step in in, in uh, uh rehabilitation and it is acknowledgement you know of the problem right. so um that that duality has always been there the good news is that it i i do see it uh reducing somewhat because people are starting to face it but that's what it's going to take right and and hopefully the the young young kids growing up, I'm sure it's you know the cultures are blending a lot, which is cool. Yeah, very cool. And like I say, that 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 young uh, teenage uh, young lady uh, that that who was happened to be white that came up right. to me. She and and I'm glad you mentioned the youth, uh, brother Joe, because the George Floyd uh, rallies and protests and all were definitely youth driven. I mean, much of that. I mean, th there were all ages there, but primarily we're talking about teens. And, and they weren't having it, okay? And, and across right. the country, you could see the rallies and marches and the school walkouts being led by youth. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it reminded me of, of uh, this is going back, you know, way to uh, SNCC, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So much of the civil rights movement was youth driven, although of course there were many adults involved as well. Right. So yeah, but this generation, just, you know, to drop all the proper English, ain't having it. Right. Gary Hines, leader, founder, uh, you know, you, you took over, you, you weren't the first founder, but you've been there the longest of the group. <laughs> correct, correct that, me. Who, who that, founded no, it? I think. Right. Yeah, sound, and uh, a quick sounds history to, to, to um, validate your question further, Brother Joe. Uh, sounds of Blackness began at my, my alma mater here in Twin Cities, McAllister College, uh, mm -hmm. a predominantly white institution of higher learning and a great one as well. Um, and in 1969, Joe, they embarked on a very ambitious program to, to conscientiously recruit students of color, primarily African-American, uh, onto the campus. And they were very successful. And one of the offshoots of that success was that the students themselves uh, organized a number of different activities. Uh, there was a, a dance group, uh, and theater group called Black Arts Midwest. Uh, there was a political group, which I'm so happy still exists, called BLAC, the Black Liberation Affairs Committee. And there was this 50 voice choir called the McAllister College Black Voices under the direction of our emeritus founder, uh, native of Beaumont, Texas, brother Russell Knighton. So we always give him that shout out. But uh, long story short, fast forward to January of 1971 and, and Russell was getting to grad, ready to graduate. And he asked yours truly uh, to come on as director and, and the vision brother Joe that, that God gave me for the group, which was actually very excellent even back then. But, but the, the vision that God gave me for the group was to follow the path of Duke Ellington. Now that surprises a lot of people when I say that uh, because we hear Duke's name and we think of jazz as we certainly should. But too many people don't know, I know you know, 
uh, that right. Duke wrote, recorded, and performed spirituals, world beat music, uh, blues, as well as jazz, every sound of blackness. So he did the music of the culture. And so uh, we can't take credit for that template. Uh, and we, we consider Duke Ellington our musical mentor. And that's the reason we change uh, and the explanation of the name Sounds mm -hmm. of Blackness. Right. Yeah. And, and you continued in Duke's tradition, uh, being an orchestrator and leader of the Sounds of Blackness for so many years. I got a question. You, you've got so many vocalists in the band over the yeah. years and, and, you know, have some big ensembles getting the voices all together. And let me ask you, and this is off the topic, but uh, during rehearsal, can you tell when someone's hit the wrong note? Um, I can, you know, the, the, <laughs> The uh, gift of, of, of uh, perfect pitch can be a blessing and a curse, you know, and it's a blessing, I, of course, we know. But, right. uh, you know, can also drive you crazy. Maybe that's why I'm so crazy. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, we, we, we hear that and, and they, they know that and they, they tease me about that, you know. And, and it's so funny because sometimes when we're in a group interview like we were uh, this past weekend in L.A., Right. And that question will come up by from the interviewer. Well, you know, you got you you're okay. You can just kind of blend in with the group and make a mistake. And they're like, no, no, he'll hear you. You can't, you can't hide. You can't hide. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, I I liken you to like a, a point guard or quarterback. You know, orchestrating <laughs> things, and you've got, you know. If you ever want to find out how many people have passed through the doors and under the tutelage of Gary Hines, just type in "Sounds of Blackness" in Wikipedia. And the roster is this long. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Is it once a member of Sounds of Blackness, always a member? Do you have that philosophy? Yes. And, yeah. and, and, and one of our uh, most renowned uh, uh, members, uh, Sounds of Blackness, own Ann Nesby, uh, started that same because Ann embarked on her uh, solo career, oh my goodness, uh, back in like 1996, five or six or so. Uh, but she said back then, even as she embarked on that solo career, uh, once a sound, always a sound. And uh, we we also have as distinguished alum uh, who's doing a, his a world grand finale uh, a tour, uh, farewell tour, brother Alexander O'Neill. So oh, shout oh, out! Wow. Alex. I didn't even know was he's okay. Yeah, going. but yeah, wow. But, uh, when he moved to Minneapolis from Natchez, Mississippi, or as he would say, right. from the step. Uh, he moved from uh, that. Yeah, he moved uh, to Minneapolis. The first band he joined was not Flight Time. He was a member of Sounds of Blackness and performed oh, okay. for about a year. And then he went on to Flight Time. And of course, the rest is history uh, as he right. went on his very solo career. And again, shout out to Alex as he embarks on his world worldwide farewell tour, uh, I believe, starting this fall. He's going to come to the States. Have you seen any dates? Oh, yeah. He, yes, he's going to. Uh, uh, traverse the 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 U.S. Uh, and uh, uh, Europe, Africa, Asia, South wow. America. Yes. Yeah. Such such a great talent. Yeah. Yes, he is. Yeah. You know what? You know another thing that I I was reading recently. Someone's I don't know who wrote the article, but they were listing the top songs ever coming out of Flight Time and Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. Number one, Optimistic. I don't know if you've seen it. I but, did. Yeah. That that is quite an honor, and and you know definitely. I, I agree. Such such a great, powerful intro with uh, Jimmy Jam and Terry. Yes. Um, they have stuck by you. You work with them on the recent uh, duo project. What was the initial contact? I mean, you've known them for years, but, you know, to join up with their label at the time and produce you. Well, you know, and, and you, you always uh, do your homework uh, to the nines, brother Joe. You're absolutely right. Uh, the, the relationship uh, between, uh, well, even just myself uh, and, and Jam and Lewis and families goes back to our parents. Um, mm -hmm. So this is going to take a second to put into pers to perspective. What brought uh, the Hines family, my family, to Minneapolis from my beloved hometown, Yonkers, New York, right. uh, was um, my mother, uh, the late great Doris Hines, who we lost uh, eight years ago today, as a matter of fact. Wow. So um, much love to your heavenly to uh, your mom. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, brother Joe. I appreciate she, believe me, she hears and accepts that. Right. Um, but Minneapolis and St. Paul were big jazz towns. A lot of that surprises a lot of people. Uh, Ellington Basie, uh, Sarah mm -hmm. Ella, who were contemporaries and friends and who mom performed with. Uh, and we would always excite, get excited, of course, when they would call the house and all that. Mom, Miss Sarah's on the line. Uh, so that's what brought, she was booked here 
in the Twin Cities, Brother Joe, for what was supposed to be two weeks. It turned into she got held over for a year. And so she <laughs> fell in love with the Twin Cities uh, and moved us here um, uh, from uh, Yonkers uh, to Minneapolis, St. Paul. Then uh, we, we remind people all the time, and I know you know this, um, Prince Jam and Lewis did not just appear the, out of a vacuum. Right. The thing that, that, that brought mom here and then ultimately brought us here was that while there was a very small black community, it was very thriving and culturally and musically active. Uh, there were R&B groups here that would have rivaled any Motown group. There were blues artists here, jazz, gospel. And again, that's that's what brought us here. And so uh, Prince's uh, uh, parents uh, mm -hmm. were, were professional musicians, Jam and Lewis and, and contemporaries of my mom. And so our family, our parents knew one another. So uh, our relationship predates uh, both Prince's and Jam and Lewis's international fame as artists and producers. Uh, and when they achieved that fame, they did not forget about us. And they brought us on and we were blessed to be the first artists signed to a prospective records, which, uh, and I was talking to a former A&M employee just the other day uh, out in LA. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, Gary, when Jam and Lewis uh, and A&M and uh, Polygram was, were the parent label and distributors and at the time, the, the biggest in the world uh, uh, of prospective records, Jam and Lewis's label. And Jimmy and Terry were working with the biggest artists in the world. I mean, Human League, George Michael, uh, Janet, uh, Michael Jackson. And surely the expectation of Polygram and A&M was that Jam and Lewis would lure some of those artists to their label. Right. And lo and behold, who's the first group they signed? Sounds of who? What? <laughs> and, and how many of them are there? And how many different types of music are they singing? And how are we going to market them? And all these questions, you know. Uh, so they were they were not happy, you know, if the truth be told, until Optimistic went number one. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. And then the rest is history. I, I saw a recent uh, video. I guess Jam gave a, a tour to someone. In the, I don't know. Have you seen that? I did. A flight uh, out in California. And, and he spoke highly still to this day about sounds. So, yes, he did. God yeah. bless. Big, always a huge shout out to Jam and Lewis. Um, you know, our friend. We would we would perform just uh, to to put the cap on your question, Joe. Mm -hmm. Sounds of Blackness uh, and uh, the Flight Time Band. Many times, I mean, before their fame, uh, you know, and Grand Central with Prince. Many right. times we would perform at the same uh, events here in the Twin Cities. Whether it was like say the annual uh, Urban League dinner or. Um, the annual Miss Black Minnesota pageant. Many times, Sounds of Blackness would open the event, you know, with the Black National Anthem and then a couple of songs, and then the evening would go on, and then the, the, the bands would close out the evening. And so the result of that scenario is that we many times spent a lot of time backstage together over the years and talking about what we were going to do and what our plans were. And, and a lot of times people uh, say we're asked, did you guys ever, you know, uh, the Minneapolis artists and the Sounds of Blackness, did you ever envision, you know, uh, all the, the the things that have come your way? Did you think it was even possible? And with, with all humbleness, we say, actually, yes, we, we didn't know, but we right. believed in our youthful exuberance. You know, we would say, one day we're going to travel all over the world and we're going to win Grammys and all these kind of things. And of course, not knowing that it was actually going to happen, but um, but the re point being the relationship went back there and the vision and the enthusiasm, um, it goes way back before anybody knew who Jam and Lewis and who Prince were, but when they did learn, they never forgot about Sounds of Blackness. Yeah. And of course, Prince stayed in the Twin Cities out in Chan Hassan where he had his studio and, and home for his later years. But, yeah. um, yeah. Oh, I'll quickly say the first person I ever viewed, interviewed in radio was Andre Simone back in 82. Oh, I love it. Man. <laughs> he was on like a solo tour um, in New York and Owen Husney called the house and he said, are you ready? I was living at my mom's house. I was still young. He said, yeah. are you ready to do the interview with Andre? I said, uh, I'm not even at the studio. Give me, give me an hour to get settled. And then I had an interview with Andre like 30 years later. So wow. we, we've talked a few times on the show. Yeah. So. Yeah. Amazing musician, great friend and brother. Uh, he's another one, um, just just uh, always supportive uh, and 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 uh, a great friend and brother. Yeah, and of course Prince, you, you and Prince were very tight, and you know a lot yeah. of phone calls. You know he would call. You guys would have some heavy discussions. And what was um? Let's talk about first musically. Um, Prince getting you involved with some of his stuff. 
Oh, absolutely, yes. And, and you're right about the phone calls, and, and we get, which were usually at two or three in the morning. Uh, which and and he would he would act like it was noon and not right. you know we'll, we'll come back to that uh, yeah. that, was, that was his trademark. But yes, uh, brother Joe uh, Prince uh, again he uh, never forgot uh, sounds of blackness like to say just like Jam and Lewis uh, when he came into his international uh, uh, celebrity uh, as an artist and um, we had performed on the same stage here in Minneapolis like I say stages uh, right. before all of that and then. Uh, when he hit the international stage, uh, oh my goodness, uh, Prince involved us in so many projects. Um, the Batman soundtrack, uh, we, he called us in and uh, uh, what was supposed to be for two hours, of course, we were out at Paisley all night, you know, that's, right. that's how it goes. And, uh, and I'll never forget, it was on Halloween of all nights kind of thing. But okay. uh, yeah, so the Batman soundtrack, uh, we did the opening of the Love Sexy Tour with him. Um, oh my God, there's just so many projects, uh, both live and studio, um, uh, private, public, uh, out at Paisley. Um, and, and it, you know what, it's still hard to go out there. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a really surreal kind of feeling um, mm -hmm. to go to Paisley. And I, I didn't go until last year when we did the Billboard Awards, we performed uh, out, uh, we uh, recorded, no, no, it was live actually that we did out right. there. Yeah. And, uh, People were asking, you know, um, what's it like to come out? And, and they were surprised when I said, you know what? I got to admit, I have not been able to bring myself to come out until this time, you know, just because I knew how difficult it would be. But it, it's a joy and a blessing and an honor and, uh, you know, to have known him. Yeah, and a surprise for just about everybody and, cr and crushing emotions, especially people who, like yourself, were friends with him. Yes, um, absolutely. Um, you know, he, you know, I was thinking back to some of the guys – or ladies that I, you know, fans of musicians and Prince, Rick James, Roger Troutman, and, you know, the lives and Michael Jackson all cut short yeah. so young. And, and like, it's almost like a running back in the NFL, you know, in their prime. And then, yeah, really sad, really sad to this day. It, yeah. it is just, just uh, heartbreaking. And just uh, every name that you said, uh, dear friends and, and, um, uh, uh, Roger Troutman, uh, another special one, yeah. just brilliant musician and, and uh, amazing human being and one of the funniest people on the planet, <laughs> uh, but but just absolutely brilliant. And, and uh, yeah, I, I went to uh, his funeral and it's just one of the, the, the saddest uh, ever. I mean, right. you know, we know what happened and he and his brother's coffins were were right next to side by side to each other at the funeral. And uh, I was seated close to their mom and the family. And it was just absolutely heart wrenching, but uh, an honor to have known and worked with him. Yeah. The last time um, I saw her zap was, well, this was after Roger pa passed and we went to Queensboro park out in New York. And uh, my wife and I are walking down the street and you're hearing the vocoder vocoder. And you're like, I know he's not going to be there, but you know, it was very emotional. Yeah. 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 Oh my goodness. To this day. Yeah. Yep. Right. So uh, let, let's talk about the new single um, woke and uh, black skin, the movie, um, the, the tie in with that was, was the movie filmed in, in the twin cities, the film, the movie, uh, it was filmed here. Uh, black okay. skin was filmed right here in the twin cities, brother Joe mm -hmm. and, uh, Director Mark Casey, and uh, who's a uh, native of Los Angeles, but but uh, wanted to film. And it's not only about George Floyd. Uh, uh, the storyline deals with uh, Philando Castile and and uh, Amir Locke. And just uh, unfortunately, uh, the number uh, of uh, murders uh, of unarmed uh, young black men by police here, right here in the Twin Cities, and we we touched on that earlier in terms of that that whole contradiction. Um, but yes, the film was uh, the, it was it was filmed here on location in the Twin Cities, um, and uh, he uh, approached us about uh, using some of Sounds of Blackness songs. And actually, there are three Sounds of Blackness songs we're blessed to have in the in the in the film Black Skin, um, Black Lives Matter, and okay. a track called Healing, and of course uh, the primary one is is Woke. Okay, so so busy with. Uh coast to coast going with uh in LA and what what is on the agenda the rest of the the latter part of the summer and heading into the fall for the sounds excellent I'm glad you asked you know this is kind of it, it's amazing how things happen in bunches uh brother Joe I'm sure you, you can attest to this so we're kind of in festival mode because 
Uh, of course, as I mentioned last, this past Saturday was the uh, reparations uh, festival in, in Los Angeles. Um, this coming Saturday is um, the community unity rally uh, and harvest uh, right here in Minneapolis. Um, okay. So at uh, Franklin Middle School Field, and it's a, a big a free outdoor festival. There's a number of artists and food and music and, and vendors and all that kind of family friendly, that kind of thing. So uh, that's our next um, uh, live performance. And uh, we're, we're uh, it's great to travel. We, we love to travel. But uh, to take a, a line out of the Wizard of Oz, there's no place <laughs> at home. So yeah, it, right. it, uh, we invite everybody out to uh, Franklin Middle School Saturday, August 19th. I believe the, the day starts at noon, and I believe Sounds hits the stage at approximately 3 o'clock uh, this, okay. this Saturday. And, and I, I caught you did our recent cruise, right? I, I saw you. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was cool. Yes. this. Uh, us, yeah, what happened? Early February, uh, we were blessed to do, and this was our second time doing it, the Soul Train cruise. Right, yeah. Uh, big shout out to Brother Tony Cornelius, another dear friend and brother. And of course, uh, the the memory and honor of his great dad, uh, Dapper Don Cornelius. <laughs> right. I, always, I would always call him Dapper Don. And Dapper Don. Uh, God bless him. Uh, a huge, huge sounds of blackness supporter, as, as well as a friend and, and brother. Like I mean, over the years and consistency, and uh, and and a mentor as well. And so we we miss him, and and we're so elated that. Uh, uh, his son, actually both of his sons, uh, but primarily Tony, uh, are continuing the, the legacy uh, of Soul Train. Yeah, that's like a who's who in R&B, funk, and, and jazz. Oh, oh, I uh, mean, I, I just, I haven't been on it, but I looked and I said, my wife and I said, we got to do that. We got to do that. And people book it like right after they just got off the last one. They're ready to go for next year. That's true. And, and, and Brother Joe, let me tell you, that you and, and, and Sister G will love no, having a sense for, of your music sensibilities. I mean, the whole day and night soul music everywhere, all 11 decks, you know, live performances, uh, uh, pre-records, videos kind of thing. It's just like soul music heaven uh, uh, to go and, and soul food. I mean, when they call it the Soul Train Cruise, they ain't playing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great time. And yeah, it's... Um... Is that the first time you did their cruise, the Soul Train one? Actually, the second time. Oh, second time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, of course, there were a couple of years off with COVID, you know. Right. Um, but we were so happy to be back. And, and oh, my goodness, just the other artists. I mean, uh, Evelyn Champagne King, Denise Williams, uh, the Spinners. Um, I, I can't even think of everybody. Um, uh, Earth, Wind and Fire. Uh, oh, my goodness. There were so many and it was just so great to, to see it and fellowship with them, you know, at the airport, on the ship, you know, in between shows. Uh, right. it's amazing. Well, let's get back. I kind of jumped over those <laughs> two and three a.m. calls from Prince and you guys right. discussing and, and, you know, can you give us a tiny snapshot of, you know, your friendship with Prince like that? Absolutely. Uh, Prince, uh, God bless him and rest his soul. Uh, like he, he had a few, he was in many ways, Joe, uh, just a regular guy, uh, a big sports guy, loved the Vikings, you know, hence the purple and all that kind of thing. Right. Uh, you know, love, love basketball. In fact, I need to say this, a lot of people don't know, or they think it was really just a parody or something about his athleticism, but mm -hmm. Prince was an all city basketball player, you know, despite his height, Right. And he came from a school where, I mean, a, a real basketball powerhouse school. Uh, we were blessed to go to the same junior high school, Bryant Junior High School, and the same senior high school, Minneapolis Central. Now, we were like six years apart, uh, five right. years apart, but uh, the schools are just a few blocks apart. And so there was a lot of interaction between the, the schools. And I'll never forget, you know, in my senior year, um, I started hearing rumors about this this dude down at Bryant, the road at Bryant Junior High School that was like a beast on every instrument, you right. know. So yeah, you guess, guess who that was, right? Uh, and uh, he he went on to Central, but but both at Bryant and at Central uh, High School, Bryant Junior High, Central Senior High, uh, Prince was all city basketball, and I mean. Uh, uh, those teams, like they won like state championship, city champ. So I mean, it was a real basketball. School. So you had to be really good just to make the team. And, right. and Prince was all city. One of the things, uh, and his quirks, since you're asking about that, uh, that he would love to do. He kept a basketball hoop out at Paisley. Okay, mm -hmm. right. And, uh, you know, of course, 
uh, you know, some of the superstar uh, actors and actresses and, and, and athletes, you know, when they were in town, they would they would come by Paisley and visit. Uh, and and when some of the jocks would come out, you know, he'd have one of the assistants pull out the hoop and say, you want to do a little one on one. Right. And they'd laugh because they didn't know. They thought, yeah, yeah, yeah right. And of course, as they say, he would take them to the hole. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, one time I asked Jellybean Johnson during an interview, uh, give me like the top five Prince band members or associated artists through the years. And he he went through like the revolution and the time guys who could play. It was pretty interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great, uh, connection, um, uh, music and, and sports and, uh, and, and coming from that tradition, even from those schools as well and in this community. Right. Well, I'm glad Prince chose music. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it was a good choice. And same with Terry Lewis. How about that? You know, and Terry's uh, Terry was an all state uh, uh, track and football halfback, you know, both track. Right. Yeah. Football, uh, but had a really severe knee injury, um, mm -hmm. which because he, he was being recruited or, already, you know, mm -hmm. like full rides, you know, uh, uh, division one schools and all that kind of thing. But this knee injury, uh, you know, was, was severe enough to cur to curtail to uh, curtail that. And uh, as you say, uh, we're 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 not while well, we're not glad that he was injured. You know, uh, the, the right. rest. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, before um, we 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 say goodbye, um, let's talk about your mom. Um, yes. You know, eight years since she passed today, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. What, what, tell, what kind of uh, lady was your mom? And and tell us about her musical style and how she passed it on to you. Oh, bless you. Uh, well, the late great Doris Hines, uh, you know, uh, her mom, so Kingston, Jamaica, uh, but, but she uh, born and raised in New York, uh, where she met and married my dad and they made me and my five siblings. Um, but uh, so you had a combination of uh, Jamaican intensity with a New York attitude. So she okay. was a force of nature <laughs> uh, uh, to be reckoned with um, and, and just an amazing human being in the words of uh, Maya Angelou, a phenomenal woman. Um, she uh, made sure that that we, speaking of, of, of the, the combination between uh, uh, physical fitness and music, she uh, had us exercise every day, even as oh, kids, wow. you know, mm -hmm. calisthenics and all that, uh, even before school and so forth, and exposed us to, she primarily sang jazz, but just like uh, she, and and I heard Miss, and Miss Ella Fitzgerald and Miss Sarah Vaughn, all of them disliked being called jazz singers. They would say, and, and Aretha uh, even disliked, and they would say, I'm a singer. Uh, people were amazed when Aretha uh, filled in for Pavarotti at, at, the, at the Grammys, and I said, no, she's uh -huh. a singer. So, uh, so mom uh, was, was part of that school as well uh, and exposed us to all the different types of music uh, uh, daily in the household and her rehearsals, uh, kept us and, and groomed us and taught us uh, African and African American history. So all of that, the roots of that, uh, go back uh, to the great Doris Hines. And she, she, like I say, performed uh, with everyone from uh, Duke Ellington uh, to Sarah Vaughan, Ella Fitzgerald, um, Nat King Cole, Della Reese, Dinah Washington. Uh, were all contemporaries uh, of Doris Hines. Yeah. So God rest her soul. I know she's smiling down on you and and, yes, and, and with you every step of the way. So. Yeah, yeah, that's a great to talk about your mom, Doris Hines. And, uh, Thank yeah. you, Brother Joe. Yeah. One one last thing. We're sure. both James Browns fans, but I know you're you're the biggest <laughs> fan. Because I have one regret. I'll, I'll tell you this quickly and let you talk okay. about James Brown. Um, I was in radio, I think it was 82 or 83. And uh -huh. uh, James was doing a tour with Wilson Pickett. And he came oh. to Connecticut. We're, we're in New York since the last year. But um, I, I wish I had that appreciation of his music and what a great performer was back then because I was backstage. I was able to meet him and Maceo was there and Mel Wilson yeah. Pickett. But as I'm thinking yes. down, I said, wow, I really could have like soaked it all up. You know, he had his hair up in curlers before the show. I think he did two shows, yeah. but he ran a, he ran a real tight ship. He told his guitarist, put out the cigarette and everything like yep. that. Yeah. What, what drew you into James Brown's world? And of course the music and performer, but what appealed mostly to you? What appealed uh, to me then and still does now, Brother Joe, uh, about the Godfather of Soul, James Brown, uh, Mr. Dynamite, Soul Brother Number One, the hardest working man in show business. I had to get the full introduction in there. Right, right. right. You did it right. <laughs> Danny Ray, Danny Ray, who we just lost last year, by the way. Right. But anyway, 
to me, Brother Joe, uh, James Brown was the embodiment of, 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 of black music, especially on the soul and R&B side. Um, and he, he defied uh, all, all of the, uh, um, all of the um, barriers uh, uh, that were present and uh, throughout the industry uh, and, and in society. Um, and he, he prevailed over all of them. And he, he wrote uh, to what is to me the most prolific song uh, in, in, in uh, black history. And that is Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times um, back in the day to, to call someone black was almost more of a fighting word than to call them the N-word. And so because, you know, there was there was such a, a railing against being black and against blackness. But he said, no, no, no. Say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. And so uh, he not only had the soul and captured uh, the culture and, and portrayed it so, so um, uh, amazingly, but he also had the consciousness. So the culture and the consciousness politically uh, with everything from, you know, like I say, from cold sweat and Papa's got a brand new bag to say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, and I don't want nobody to give me nothing, open up the door, I'll get it myself. Right. Uh, without an education, might as well be dead. So James had that political, that awareness conscious side that as I talk to younger artists today, I implore them to do the same. Yes, have your, your party music, but take a, a, a cue out of the, the words of uh, the great Gamble and Huff song, Message in Our Music, and one of my favorite R&B lyrics, it says, understand while you dance. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, well said about that. Plus he had the dance moves and Prince too. Oh my God. With the split. When, when Prince stopped doing the splits, I was a little disappointed. <laughs> I was a lot disappointed, but I wish he had, now I understand. I wish he hadn't done the splits, but yeah. yeah, yeah considering but what happened to him. Yeah. Both, both with uh, Prince and Michael would be the first and they're, they're on record as I know you're saying it, that, you know, they're without even, it wasn't even worth arguing. Their biggest influence was James Brown. Right. Right. So, wow. Hey, we got to tell our, our listeners, viewers, soundsofblackness.org, right? It's the, it. the hub, but you know, you can go to all the different uh, music distribution places to to get woke and the catalog of Sounds of Blackness music going back. How about how about the records going back to 78? Yeah. You going to re-release them? Uh, you, you know what? Actually, some of them are. We're still... Um... Uh, gathering some of the early ones, uh, you know, before we were signed to a label and all of that. And uh, also, we want to encourage uh, all your your wonderful listeners, uh, Brother Joe, to when they do uh, go to the different platforms, please look for our recent singles as well. Hold up your light. Uh, mm -hmm. and so thankful and your hashtag you're going to win. Um, mm -hmm. They're really part of a they kind of join at the hip in terms of our anthems, uh, you know, as well as time for reparations and 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 so forth. So, uh, and you can see the videos for You're Gonna Win and, and uh, Hold Up Your Light, uh, as well as, as uh, Time for Reparations and Juneteenth Celebration and Woke all on YouTube. Get them all, get them all. <laughs> yeah. So much love to you, Gary, and the sounds of blackness and uh, hey. continue, you know, continue doing what you do because you've given us so much for so many, so many decades now. Um, bless yeah. you. Thank you. Only... Only by the grace of God, by the dedication of Sound of Blackness singers and band, and the third and most crucial element uh, is people like you. Because, you know, there's a scripture that says, how will the people hear without a preacher? Well, when it comes to music, how will they hear without a DJ, without a Joe, without a WVOF? We can make all the music we want, but if, if we don't have people that will play it, it won't be heard. So on behalf of Sound of Blackness, thank you, Brother Joe. Yeah, thanks, Gary. I appreciate that. Yes, sir. Yeah. We hate you. All right. Much love, Gary. All right. Peace and love. Stay woke.